Hi, Martin. Hello. And nice I, to have you here today. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for your invitation to talk to you. Yeah, that's my pleasure. So today my guest is Martin Grutschel. He's a retired professor of information technology at TU Berlin in Germany. His main areas of research are discrete mathematics, optimization, and OR. He has made significant contributions to polyhedral combinatorics and to the development of methods proving the polynomial time solvability of optimization problems. He has also focused on the design of practically efficient algorithms for hard combinatorial optimization problems, such as the traveling salesman, the max cut, the linear ordering, and various connectivity problems. The application areas of his work include telecommunications, chip design, energy, production planning and control, logistics, and public transport. Martin's scientific achievements were honored with several distinctions, including the Cantor Medal, the Leibniz, the Backwards, the Danzig, the Fulkerson, and the John von Neumann Theory Prizes. He holds four honorary degrees and is a member of seven scientific academies, including the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. From 93 to 94, he was the president of the German Mathematical Society. From 1991 to 2015, he was vice president and then president of the Zuse Institute of Information Technology in Berlin. From 2002 to 2008, he shared the DFG Research Center Matthew, Mathematics for Key Technologies. From 2007 to 2014, he was Secretary General of the International Mathematical Union, and more recently, from 2015 to 2020, he was President of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Martin has been an open access and open science activist and is currently involved in fostering digital humanities. He and his wife enjoy traveling, understanding and appreciating varied cultures and exploring their history and archaeology. Martin, you were one of the giants uh, of our field. Uh, it's such an honor to have this opportunity to talk to you. So thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Oh, thank you for, you for the invitation. It's too much of an honor. I'm just an ordinary person. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Much. Uh, so why don't you start telling me uh, when and where were you born? So I was born in 1948 in a small town named Schwelm in Germany. This is about 50 kilometers east of Cologne. And uh, the story behind that is that uh, my parents uh, are actually from Silesia, which is uh, now a part of Poland, but belong to Germany. And at the end of World War II, Poland was shifted uh, by the Soviet Union westwards. I mean, the Soviets took parts of it, uh, which are now belonging to Belarusia and Ukraine, and gave the Pol Polish parts of Germany, including Silesia, and they moved out my family from there. And uh, this is what is called displaced persons. And that's how they came to sh this little town, Schwellen, where I was later born. Yeah. All right. Grutschel does not appear to be a common surname in Germany, right? That is correct. I actually checked uh, how many people in Germany have my name, and I figured this out through telephone lists and the like, and there seem to be less than 500 people with that name. So it's quite rare, yeah. Wow. But don't ask me what the name means and where it comes from. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh uh, you, you mentioned your parents. Uh, could you talk a bit more about them? Well, I mean, they have been farmers for about 400 years in Upper Silesia and uh, then had to leave uh, uh, their home. And uh, my father had no choice after the war. He became a metal worker uh, and tried to make a living in the West, which was very bad after World War II. But uh, we are not the only family that had all these problems. And that the same happened to the Polish people who moved into the farm of my parents. They were also displaced and forcefully moved from their homes in near Lwiv or Lwiv, uh, Lemberg, which is the same, to this area. And it's just terrible that these things of moving people around still happen today. If we look what is happening in Ukraine, in Israel, Palestine, Yemen, Afghanistan, and so on, uh, people are not learning, and uh, that is what is very sad to hear. My family has experienced uh, that uh, life in this respect in the 40s and 50s, but now we are pretty okay, and uh, our life in Germany is fine, but in other parts of the world, it's not like that. Uh -huh. 
Are you an only child? I am the only child of my parents. Yeah, of course. After World War II, people were not in the mood of having many children. They had trouble to survive and build up a new life, and they have lost all of their property and were poor. And uh, they always thought they could go back, but it did not happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how was life throughout the 50s and 60s? Well, the 50s and 60s was, of course, a time of prosperity in Germany. We had what was called Wirtschaftswunder. The uh, German economy grew, and uh, so uh, did my family uh, do better than before. We bought a house and uh, had a decent life. And uh, I think I had a wonderful childhood. I had caring parents and relatives, and I uh, enjoyed my childhood and youth, yeah. Yeah, uh, I have a little story. Uh, when my mom was living in England in 1952 and 1953, because my grandfather went there uh, to do masters at the Imperial College in London, they went for a Euro trip by car. Uh, yes. My grandfather he purchased a car, first car at, at the time, and they went to all sorts of places, including Germany, and they went to Hamburg. Uh, and there was a point where they got lost, and they asked a person for directions. And that person, uh, you know, gave instructions. And then uh, they tried to follow that instructions, but at some point, uh, they spot that person again. And, and he said, yeah, I knew you were going to make this mistake. So this is the right uh, way to go. Uh, so uh, my mom had a very good impression of people at a time in Germany. They were very friendly, you know, the survivors of the war and all of that. So uh, I can only imagine that it was a different time and uh, people were trying to move on and try to be nice to one another, right? Yeah, this was a time where uh, everybody tried to build back uh, and build a new life after all this terror of the Second World War. And uh, Germany was in a bad position having this Nazi period, which was uh, incredible, uh, un not understandable. Uh, it's called event is not the right thing to say, but uh, disaster, I would say, for uh, Germany. And uh, we were not very proud of being German in those years. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand. Uh, do you have any recollections about your Germany history classes in school? Yeah, I think the teachers tried to avoid speaking about this because most of them were uh, even studied or educated or were even teachers in the Nazi period and somehow tried to avoid uh, discussions uh, with the students. And this took until the end of the 60s when the German uh, student revolution started. But that was not only in Germany, that was all over the world. And uh, all of a sudden, things changed. And then this time uh, came into focus, and people were questioning teachers, professors, and so on, what they had done during Nazi period. But in the 50s and 60s, it was still kept under the carpet somehow. Mm -hmm. Germany won the 1954 World Cup in Switzerland, uh, yeah. which became known as Das Wunder von Bern, um, yeah. or the Miracle of Bern. I know you were a small kid when that happened, but do you have any memories from that event? Um, honestly, uh, not real memories, I think, because my parents didn't have a TV in those days or years, and uh, I don't remember having watched the game. Uh, but now, later on, you see so many reports and documentaries that you think it's your own memory. But <laughs> <laughs> So I know about it, but I don't think it's authentic memory. Yeah. Yeah, but it, of they... course, was a great event for Germany that after the, war, after the disaster of the World War II in the Nazi period, Germany uh, well, won something significant. Yeah, that, yeah, was, that was exactly what I was going to ask, is if that uh, improved their morale or they felt... Yeah nice after so many bad things and there's there's even the movie right they they did a yes. lot of this wonderful movie yeah I, yeah I agree i watched that uh since you're talking about sports uh did you take part of any sports activity oh yeah uh, i did a lot of sports when i was a kid i mean i was playing handball basketball football but i liked track and field best uh, athletics and i for two years or so, I really did it intensively. Yeah. But uh, but I still enjoy doing sports nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, you excel in in shot put, right? You you had a good ranking in Germany. 
Yeah, I have to admit I was among the top 10 shot putters in my age group in 1966. Uh, and um, yeah, but uh, I, I stopped doing this because it makes no sense to do that more professionally. If you look at uh, today's shot putters, uh, like the world champion, uh, I mean, he eats 21 eggs a day, a, a kilogram of meat and uh, a kilogram of rice and so on. You don't want to have 150 kilos and lots of muscles. Uh, it makes no sense to do this kind of sport anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although this Ryan Krauser is a great athlete, there's no doubt about it, but he's uh, deforming his body completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he will not live a long life, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, I know you were an avid reader. Uh, what were your main preferences at that time? Yeah, I thought about it and I do think I read everything. I mean, uh, wide and broadly novels, history books, science books, uh, uh, autobiographies of people. And I really enjoyed reading and the preferences changed over time. I remember loving Hemingway or John Steinbeck, Kurt Vonnegut, Kadia Rassi, Günter Grass, or something like that. Uh, but nowadays, I still read a lot uh, detective stories which have some uh, social, cultural, or scientific content. I really enjoy uh, mixing uh, thrill and science. I, I, I just read a book about uh, fags uh, that destroy viruses and uh, there is some real story behind it, and it is well pack packaged, and uh, it's a it's a good way to get some insight in, into other sciences and have some thrill while reading that. Yeah, yeah, seems very exciting. You wonder went military service for eighteen months between nineteen sixty seven and nineteen sixty nine, correct? Yeah, this is correct. Uh, in this time, uh, there uh, there was still compulsory military service in Germany. And uh, the question was uh, whether you are a conscientious rejecter or not. And uh, I have to admit, I did not like military service at all. But uh, if you look at the time there, I mean, there was a Cold War, there were these nuclear experiments, the Cuba crisis, and so on. And I think it is inevitable to do your service somehow, because there are always all these dangers around. But um, military is not uh, my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's change partially the topic. Uh, what was your impression of the Cold War as a young man? Yeah, this was uh, actually threatening in, in this period of time. I mean, uh, if you were, uh, you were not born then, but when they had these uh, nuclear experiments and there was radiation everywhere in the world and there was this uh, wall in, uh, in Germany and, uh, and so on. Uh, the Russians had 340,000 soldiers in East Germany and uh, G West Germany had uh, half of them only. And uh, there was still this danger that they are, uh, that some war is going to break out soon. And uh, uh, although the local life uh, was uh, pleasant and fine, uh, but there was this overall, danger, which is happening right now in the same way. I mean, if you are in Europe and you see uh, what is happening in the Ukraine and how the uh, Baltic states or Poland are afraid or Georgia are afraid of an attack by, by Russia, that's a similar feeling uh, as in the time of the 60s and uh, very uneasy. Uh, I'm definitely the case. Yeah. Right. So there was this tension, constant tension going on. But yeah. you had to learn how to cope with, with that. Yeah, you have to cope with this because as a, some ordinary person, you can have not much to do about it except for electing the right people who make good choices. That's, that's it. And uh, hope that uh, other people in the world also understand that war is not a solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When and why did you decide to pursue a mathematics degree uh, at university? Yeah, actually, when I uh, was in high school, uh, I had three subjects I really liked. Uh, one was history and archaeology, one was chemistry, and the third was mathematics. And I really tried hard to figure out what uh, I would like to do. And for history and archaeology, I saw there is no real career. I mean, you become teacher or work in a museum or something like that. 
It was not my plan. And I thought you can do this on the side as a hobby. And I still do that. And then uh, the Bayer company offered the course, summer courses for good chemistry students. And I went to that. They did a great job, but uh, I decided that's not what I want to do in the future. <laughs> and so mathematics remained. And I really thought of combining mathematics with economics, management science, like, like something like that. But studies of that type did not exist in those days. So you either study mathematics and then look for a second subject and learn something about economics and management science. And this is what I did. Yeah, I see. Did you have the chance to learn about OR during the undergrad? Uh, not in mathematics at all. And in uh, the economics department, they had something what was called Wirtschaftsmathematik, economics, mathematics. And I do recall that they even taught the simplex algorithm and made the Tableau method. But nobody told anything about shadow prices or anything. It was just arithmetic pure learning of algorithms that did not make sense and I wasn't clear why I should learn this in those days. And I really did not learn OR during my studies, yeah. Okay, so you didn't have the geometric background and the idea nothing. of basic solution nothing, and nothing vertices, yeah, okay. <laughs> Were you exposed to computers and programming at the time? Yes, uh, actually, in, immediately in my first semester, uh, the I was studying in the, at the University of Bochum, that is in the Ruhrgebiet. Uh, they offered programming courses, and uh, that was the beginning of my interest in computers. Uh, but there was no application at all. You, I learned Algol. That was my first language that I learned. And later on, I also learned a little bit of Fortran. And uh, when I... Uh, uh, worked in the, in the summer at IBM. I learned Assembler and PL1 and so on, and that made it much more ex exciting. So I really loved PL1 until I noticed uh, that's not a program to have a good perform <laughs> programming language with good performance. But anyway, uh, that uh, generated my interest in programming and uh, using computers. Yeah. Yeah, some people from our field uh, particularly disliked using punch cards in those days. How about you? Well, that was not the only thing available. The pun, the, you, the, you had paper rolls that is also existed, but uh, punch cards was the better choice. But sometimes you lose your punch cards and you have to sort them again. It was a pain in the neck and it's un, un, uh, conceive, inconceivable nowadays that you program that way and how much waste of time that is. Yeah, And uh, checking errors, I mean, I even remember what a uh, core dump is nobody knows uh, that anymore they print out the whole core and then you look into the hexadecimal figure uh, uh, figures there and figure out where the mistake in your program is and also it's really terrible yeah but anyway yeah. it did not disturb me and i finally learned how to program yeah yeah i can only imagine how how you guys did it in the late 60s and early 70s did you have to write a thesis as a requirement for obtaining your degree Yes, in mathematics, you have to write a thesis, a master's thesis. And uh, there, as I said, there was not much of application and applied mathematics at my university. So I did pure math and I wrote my thesis on, on the theorem of Frobenius for convergent power series rings. That was the subject. That is complex analysis. And uh, my supervisor asked me to transfer that result into algebra. And that is an uh, integrability uh, condition for differential equations, which I have to formulate in power series rings with uh, valued fields and the like. And uh, yeah, it was complicated stuff and I enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, at the end of it, uh, the, um, the, my, one of my questions to my supervisor has changed my career, namely, uh, I asked him, now I have shown the theorem of Frobenius uh, for this gener and the generalization you suggested. Do you think anybody will be interested in this? He said, well, maybe in 100 years, physicists may be interested in this. And I said, Dad, it's too long. And I think this is uh, not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in doing mathematics, which has real uh, application at my time of the life and I would like to do something like that and he actually offered me a job but I re rejected it and uh, 
thought, went into OR as uh, you know, yeah. which was another story of its own. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a while. Before you continue with your academic trajectory, uh, I would like to to briefly talk about two important events in 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 Germany. Uh, the first one was the 1972 Olympic Games uh, that yeah. was held in, in Munich. Since you were very much into sports, uh, did you have the chance to attend the event? Yes, I was very happy. I had a good friend whose father was a businessman and who managed to get tickets. And uh, we got the tickets from, from the friend, uh, friend's father. And I attended uh, basketball and, uh, and the final of the hockey game, uh, namely Germany against Pakistan, where Germany won 1 0, and the Pakistani got really upset because it was a last minute goal. Uh, but uh, the most interesting events were track and field, and uh, I saw Dick Fosbury uh, flipping over uh, in high jump. But the big event was the marathon, namely, uh, there, w there was a, a annoying incident, namely just one minute and a head ahead of the leader of the marathon uh, runners, some young guy jumped into the tunnel leading into the stadium and ran into the stadium and 80,000 people cheered and, and, and enjoyed his appearance and they didn't notice that he was not really a marathon runner and he had almost completed the round, then the real leader uh, came in and uh, I was very sorry for him, and uh, Frank Shorter, who was a U.S. American uh, runner, uh, came into a stadium that was completely quiet. The audience didn't know what was happening, and only after he completed the round, people noticed what was what was happening. And I, I think uh, this is uh, was really bad because an Olympic gold medal is the high point of an athlete's life and they've taken away from him the joy of uh, cheering 80, 80, an audience of 80,000 people and uh, but uh, that's a special event I still yeah. remember. Yeah. yeah this 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 story involving this imposter is quite famous and yeah I feel sorry for that guy but at the same time it's uh, it's quite amusing too. But I, I later on saw uh, an interview of him and uh, Frank Shorter uh, was over it. And in particular, he was the only gold medalist in Munich. He was born in Munich, although he was an American. He was born in Munich and he enjoyed uh, it in the end, of course. Yeah. Wow. And what about the 1974 World Cup in Germany? I suspect you were very pleased with the result. Yes, uh, but tell the truth, I uh, saw only two games and they both were Brazil games. Uh, Namely, the first one was Brazil against Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. And Brazil won 3-0, and this, it was in Gelsenkirchen. And the second was in Dortmund, namely Netherlands against Brazil. You know the result? Yeah, not very good for us. <laughs> it was 2-0 for the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a really good game, and uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, in fact, I could have gotten tickets for the final because another friend had a ticket, but I had an examination on, the, on Monday morning after the ticket for some reason, and I just couldn't go to Munich for that. But it was, of course, joyful to see Germany win over the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Netherlands had this wonderful team led by Cruyff and other guys. Yes. And uh, uh, it's a pity that they never won, right? And both in 74 yeah. and 78, they, they came as runner-ups, but they didn't win. But I think both teams, Germany and Netherlands, had the peak of their teams in these years, in the early 70s, yeah, with Beckenbauer, Beckenbauer yeah. and, and Meyer, Sepp Meyer, and so on. And same with the Netherlands with Koif, Neskens, and so on, yeah. Yeah, it's sad that uh, Beckenbauer died recently. Yes, uh, it's true, yeah. Yeah. So now, uh, resuming your uh, professional uh, trajectory uh, or your academic trajectory. When did you finally have the chance to delve into war? Yeah, so that I so in Germany we have what is called the German Acad Academic Scholarship Foundation, Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes is the German name, which supports uh, good German students. So you you have to be. Uh, nominated by somebody, then pass through various tests, and then you can get a scholarship. 
and they support less than a half percent of the German students. And I got such a fellowship, and they, but they also offer summer schools. And that was the change of my academic career. Namely, there was a summer school on operations research and econometrics, and uh, that was uh, managed and held by Bernhard Korte and Wilhelm Krelle. And uh, I learned for the first time about combinatorial optimization and this stuff, and I said, this is what I want to do. Um, of course, they all made promises in those days that there are all these applications, but these applications in those days were still in principle because they could not really solve practical problems and data were not available, but I, there was clear, it was clear that is time to come. And um, so, uh, Although I was doing pure mathematics, uh, I was trying to go into the subject. And Bernard Korte actually had just uh, received a call from Bonn University for a chair in operations research. And he, he needed what we call research assistance. And I asked him whether I could get such a job, although I had no idea about it. And uh, I got one uh, because I was in this uh, Studienstiftung. Uh, but of course, there was also not a big competition because nobody, nowhere in Germany education in this field existed. So there was no young people who could do this kind of research already and know something. So we were all beginners. And this was uh, one of the best moves of my uh, academic life. I need to uh, go into the subject and go to Bonn. And uh, there was also the newly founded Sonderforschungsbereich about econometrics and operations research. and. Bernard was a master of in, by inviting people, organizing workshops and uh, academic events, and I took uh, full advantage of all that. Mm -hmm. So you started your PhD uh, at Bonn in 1973, right? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And who introduced you to polyhedral combinatorics? Yeah, this was uh, just at the beginning. So on the 1st of September 1973, so I had my master's degree in July, and then on 1st of uh, September, I started my job in Bonn. And as I said, there was only a few other people, and Bernard Korte invited guest professors. And a few days after I arrived, Manfred Patberg arrived as a guest professor. And... Uh, I was not shy. I went into his office and asked him what kind of research he is doing. And he seriously explained to me what he does and what polyhedral combinatorics is, what I had not heard before. And then he told me about open problems uh, concerning traveling salesman problem and the like. And he said, why don't you try solving this? And I was fortunate that I solved some of the problems uh, quickly and uh, came back to him and he told me, well, let's we can start working together, okay? And that is how my uh, career in polyhedral combinatorics, cutting planes and the like started because Manfred had already this idea that cutting planes in those days had a bad name because uh, the Gomory cutting planes did not work. At least the implementation of those days did not work. It doesn't mean they don't work in general, but there were no really success stories. And he said, we need better cutting planes, deep cuts, facets, and so on. And we have to investigate this. And I believe the story, and this story is true, and uh, that is how all that started. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this started a lifetime friendship with Manfred and collaboration, and also collaboration with his students like Giovanni Rinaldi and others. Yeah. Yeah, so taking the initiative to go and, and to knock the door and uh, speak with him changed your uh, academic life in a way. Definitely. You know, the first step was asking men at court to offer me a job. And the second was uh, uh, knocking at Manfred's door and uh, getting problems that I really enjoyed looking at and uh, that I could work on successfully. Yeah, that, that was uh, a really very good decision yeah, for myself. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, many legends visited Bonn when yeah. you were there, including Lawrence Woolsey, uh, Lazo Lovas, George Nemhauser, Vasek Schwatel, uh, Jack Edmonds, uh, Rino Kahn, Claude Berge, and so on. Were you aware of how lucky you were at the time for having the opportunity to meet so many stars from the field? Initially, not yet, but then I went to the first conferences and saw these are the stars of, of the time and uh, 
I mean, there are many more, like uh, Peter Hammer, the Lenstra brothers, and Ellis Johnson, and Dick Cottle, and and, and can could keep keep on going. They all pass by uh, Bonn, and they gave lectures, and you learn from all of these lectures, and uh, you have personal interaction. And that was the important part in those days, because there was no electronic communication. I mean, you could write letters. It took forever. But in letters, I mean, it's not the same as discussing things uh, live with persons. And that was really exciting. And I know this is uh, an absolutely privileged position to be in Bond and having all these people come passing by and take advantage of their knowledge and learn for yourself. And I, I, it was a really good location for me and many others. I'm not the only one who benefited from this, of course. Yeah. Yes. Uh, which language and computer did you use in those days uh, for your experiments? Uh, actually, I was still using PL1 because I was use, uh, using uh, MPSX from IBM for LP solvers uh, to solve uh, TSP problems. And uh, that was still the case. But Manfred, for instance, hated it. He used Fortran only and he worked with Wade uh, Naldi with Fortran. But I mean, things change over time. I mean, later things move, people move to C and C++ and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that was still PL1, yeah. PL1, okay. Uh, you broke the world record for the largest TSP instance solved to optimality in 1975. Tell me the story behind this remarkable achievement. Yeah, the story was uh, that, uh, of course, Manfred had set me on the track of ca characterizing facets of the traveling salesman problem. and. Uh, then I said, well, I have all these facets. Of course, there's a sub to elimination constraints and Cartel had a special kind of comb constraints. I generalized this to more comb constraints later with pulley blank, uh, pulley blank to click tree constraints and so on. I wanted to make use of this. Does that really work in practice? And so I uh, looked up a German uh, street atlas, which is shell, shell atlas, per, and uh, I just typed all the data in 120 cities and set this as a goal to solve that. Uh, of course, you could not copy and read it in. You have to do all the typing yourself. And then uh, I ran uh, the first LP relaxation and it was a fractional solution. And then I made a drawing of the, section of the fractional solution and spotted the cutting planes uh, on uh, the picture there. So I saw violated comb constraints and sub to elimination constraint, typed them in on, on punch cards and resend them to the machine and iterated this 13 times. And I found 96 inequalities. And then the output was an optimal solution of 120 city problem. And uh, that was a miracle that this went so quickly and fast. And then I started believing that this kind of approach would work. And I always thought <clears throat> nobody will be able to repeat this kind of experiment. It's ridiculous. You only do this for your PhD thesis and not for anything else. So you have to automatize this process. So without knowing what I was thinking of, I thought about separation routines that automatically find cutting planes. But at this time, uh, I did not know that yet, that concept yet. Uh, but that was uh, something uh, unexplored uh, in my mind. And uh, that is what then came out with the uh, with Katjian's ellipsoid method that all of a sudden brought this uh, to the real interest of uh, operations research. Yeah. Yeah, right. We're going to talk about that in a while. This is a fascinating story. Uh, it's just mind boggling, right? To first type the instance, then to uh, manually try to separate cuts and and then you don't have room for mistake and and when you're doing everything manually uh there there, there are chances of you know uh, making a one or two mistakes so so you were really a very resilient person i would say to to go through that process uh i suppose it took some days right to, to oh yeah <laughs> but, well, i think it was a couple of weeks but there was even a, a funny story uh <clears throat> Two, two years later, somebody else pointed out there is an error, namely an error in the data, namely the distance between two cities is 62 kilometers and not 628 kilometers as it was in my uh, data list. And uh, then I checked it and that was right. But the story was, this was a symmetric table. 
So where and I and I typed in the lower part and the upper part was supposed to be symmetric, but in the upper part it was 62, in the lower it was 628. So the mistake was in the original data, uh, but I recomputed it. It was still optimal solution. So <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Wow, that's just incredible. Where did you go after completing your PhD? Well, uh, I stayed in Bonn because I had a job there and I could stay for a couple of more years. And in Germany, uh, to, in order to become a professor, at least in those days, you have to write another thesis, which is called habilitation in Germany. Uh, and uh, only with a habilitation, you can apply for a professorship. And so I did this. And of course, I did some other work, uh, which we may talk about uh, later in order to uh, well, broaden my research and not stay at the traveling salesman problem all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So you found a position uh, in 1982, right? Yeah, in 19, 1982, I went to the University of Augsburg and uh, I have I made a, a clear choice. I mean, uh, since uh, I uh, saw we're, I, we will talk about the work with Lovas and Schreiber, which became pretty famous in those days, I had uh, several offers uh, and was number one on several lists in, in Germany, but I decided to go to a brand new university that was uh, just founding a mathematics department. And uh, when I was interviewed, I said I would, would be interested in starting Wirtschaftsmathematik, what I told you in the beginning, because I think that is something that is important and there will be many students coming to uh, study something combined. and. Uh, this uh, the committee enjoyed it and they offered me the position and gave me a free ticket to do what i want and so i uh, basically designed this uh, with uh, courses in optimization operations research interlined with computer science and courses in business administration and management science and that was a very successful uh, story and that's why i went to augsburg and uh, uh, that was a uh, very uh, interesting days and I was able, uh, due to that, to really get into contact with industry because uh, part of uh, the study program was required internships in industry. So, but then I have to find internships, internship positions in industry. So my colleagues and me went to the industry around Augsburg and we found companies who were interested in hiring mathematics students for that. And both liked it. The students liked it. The companies liked it. Many of them got jobs and we got new pro projects. And I worked for almost 30 or 40 year, 30 years with Siemens together, optimizing the factory floor and uh, uh, internal traffic and uh, assembly lines and so on. That was a very, very important part of it. So it was a com combined thing, education. Uh, application and research, and uh, it was a really successful story. Yeah, yeah that's very nice. So uh, as soon as you joined Augsburg, you already showed your managerial abilities could make an impact on the students and also doing this interaction between academia and industry is also very important. Uh, Martin, could you share a bit about the story behind the development of the branch and cut algorithm? Uh, including the formalization of separation procedures and so on? Okay. So, as I said before, that thing like separation algorithm was in my mind, but not only my mind, but also others. Uh, uh, but there was no formal concept yet, and it was not clear that this is an important topic to do research on. And this is what changed through the ellipsoid method, namely, uh, the work uh, I did with uh, Latsi Lovas and Lex Schreiber, and it was in parallel done by others like uh, Padberg and Rao and, and Karp and Papa Dimitriou and so on, uh, they also saw that uh, cutting planes can be added on the run and you can keep on going. And uh, it doesn't mean you have to have them all in the beginning. Uh, but uh, then we noticed that we could formulate problems and uh, prove polynomial time algorithmic relationships. And that was a really, I think, an important discovery, uh, uh, but not only by Lovas, Schreiber, and myself, to see that uh, you can have, uh, say, 
membership problem, namely uh, given a convex set somehow, and the point, is it inside or not, or outside? Is it a member? If you have a point and a, and a set and you look for a cutting plane, separating it or being inside, if you have an inequality, is it valid or not? And, or if you want to optimize, and uh, we were able to finally figure out that all these algorithmic problems are polynomial time equivalent. That means when you can solve one in polynomial time, can you can solve the other in polynomial time. And that is something thrilling, namely for linear programming. If you want, you, you have now a result that shows if you can prove that a point is, uh, satisfies all inequalities, then you can find a polynomial time algorithm. You have a polynomial time algorithm to solve a linear program. Uh, and but the real thrill was you don't have to have an explicit system. You can have an infinitely large system or with a, two to the end or even more inequalities as long as you can find solve the separation problem. And for instance, for the subtotal elimination constraints, we are two, two to the end of them. Uh, you cannot just list them all and check. And that was at the same time, independently of this development, solved by Manfred Padberg and Saman Hong. They figured out that using network flow algorithms, you can separate the sub to elimination constraints. So here was already an ingredient of a separation algorithm that runs in polynomial time that implies that for the TSP uh, inequalities with cutting planes, you have a polynomial time algorithm. And this started a real hunt for separation algorithms. And a couple of hundred new algorithms came out for solving uh, integer combinatorial optimization problems by designing separation algorithms. And I think that is theoretically very interesting and practically sometimes interesting and important, namely when you have good separation inequality, separation algorithms, they could be heuristic, they could be exact, and that has shown in uh, in the long run be extremely successful and helpful in practice. Yeah. Yeah. Some people might take for granted now the idea of adding cutting planes uh, on demand, but uh, you guys had to uh, really figure it out how to do it and now it seems very natural but uh, as you said in those days uh, people were not really uh, thinking of separation algorithms and their complexity and so on right yes and and as you said about not only cutting planes of branch and cut of course branch and bound was a much older development i mean cutting planes were also existent but uh, somehow ran, went out of uh, investigation because they seemed not to work which later on turned to be wrong, but turned out to be wrong. But now combining branch and cut. And of course, uh, there were also many people involved. And in, when I was in Augsburg, I had two excellent students, which was uh, Michael Jünger, or Mike Jünger, and Gerd Reinhold. And we developed such branch and cut algorithms for the linear ordering and the acyclic subgraph problem and for max cut. And uh, the question is, how do you branch when and when cutting planes in the run later on? I mean, there are all these many issues that are still uh, major uh, topics in today's uh, commercial software, how to do what and when and what knowledge you keep in mind and so on. And what was also coming, uh, becoming important looking at, set, at an individual inequality as a knapsack constraint. And then, of course, you describe the knapsack, knapsack polytope for that. And you keep this in your memory and you check these knapsack inequalities and enlarge problems and so on. That was wonderful research. And there were, there were many, many people involved in this. And uh, in Augsburg, this was in particular with um, Gerd Reinhold and Mike Jünger. And there was also Yoshiko Wakabayashi, you know pretty well, one of my Brazilian students who made a great career in Sao Paulo later on. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, you mentioned some uh very distinguished names uh how was the experience of working with remarkable people like uh, manfred padberg lazulovas alexander shriver and you know yeah. others that was uh, inter uh interesting different working styles so uh, manfred uh, in a sense was a pain in the neck uh, and friendly i mean it friendly uh when uh, he he when he was in bonnie his family was living in berlin 
So he would come by car on Sunday afternoon from Berlin to Bonn, arrived at 10 o'clock and called me up and said, Martin, I'm here, we start working, okay? <laughs> Sunday night at 10 o'clock was not a good time. My girlfriend, which is now my wife, <laughs> for almost 50 years, <laughs> but was not very happy. And uh, my, so we worked until three o'clock or so, and then uh, he went to bed and I started working at eight o'clock uh, again. And so it was, it was, uh, uh, different working hours, uh, but still it was uh, friendly and uh, very successful uh, and uh, enjoyable working with him because it was very vibrant and lively and uh, uh, well, the, the work with uh, Lovas and Schreiber was very different. We were uh, much better planned. We would meet every now and then in Hungary, in Holland, in the US, in Germany or so for one or two weeks and were concentrated for two weeks from the morning at eight o'clock until midnight then we uh, ate a, a lot of chocolate and uh, two two more hours to go uh, uh, but it was similarly enjoyable but a different working style and uh, but uh, it was also a source of friendship and i'm really happy that uh, i have some still good friends with all of these people that people i worked with and in a similar period in augsburg i also worked closely with klaus trümper you may know uh, we worked on uh, cycles in binary matroids and the like, which are generalizations of the Max Cut problems and uh, and so on. Uh, he was again a different person. So, but I somehow was able to adapt to the different circumstances and become friends with these people. And we are still in contact, and uh, it's enjoyable to have these friends. But it's important uh, in in uh, I think that in mathematics. Uh, we have no prejudices. I mean, these people are different. You don't care where they are from, what they believe in, and so on, as long as they are reasonable people and you can work with and we understand what we are going to do, uh, you can work well. And that is one thing that is nice in mathematics, uh, that we are not dominated by politics, religion, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I understand that. Uh, I think you can confirm that uh, uh, Alexander Shriver, he... He literally reads every single reference that he cites and he remembers pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so I just show you, here is this book, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have them too. <laughs> and you see there are all these yellow things in here. So uh, this is uh, the Bible of combinatorial optimization. And uh, it's just incredible uh, what uh, the work Lex has done. And uh, he is fantastically uh, th thorough. I mean, he had all the papers that are mentioned in his book, he read them, and he has them at home in Amsterdam and with quotes and checks and uh, scribbles and so on. And uh, you can be sure that everything he quotes is correct and he has checked it himself. And it's, it's an incredible piece of work, and that will stay for a long time as the Bible of combinatorial optimization. Yeah. Yes, and yes. Uh, it is wonderful, and, and Latsi has this incredible memory. I mean, uh, I remember one point in time where we tried to improve one inequality just by some little thing, and we couldn't get it out, and they just, oh, that must be in this and that book that I learned in uh, in university and he jumped up and picked the book and page something and here it was if we use this little version of the inequality we could prove what we need and that, uh, that is amazing to see uh, the quality of these people and I profited a lot from working with uh, Lovas, Schreiber, Pattberg and Trümper and, and others yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's just amazing to hear all these stories um, and at that period was really uh, busy for yeah. uh, linear programming, integer programming. Uh, in the late 70s, uh, linear programming was finally shown to be polynomially solvable. And um, and then uh, you guys came up with the ellipsoid method uh, for combinatorial optimization. And, and then in 1984, there was the famous algorithm by Karmakar. And so how was your reaction to the publication of his work? So number one, the ellipsoid method is, of course, the first algorithm that is provable polynomial running time for solving linear programming problems, but it's a computational disaster. So I don't have, I haven't found anybody who could make it work in practice. And I openly admit it, it's a real theoretical tool. 
And the Kamaka in 84 jumped out and said, now I have the real tool for optimization for linear programming. But his presentations uh, on the computational performance left a lot of doubts. I mean, I was in uh, his uh, plenary talk at the 1984 Boston uh, ISNP, and uh, people were a bit upset about the way he explained things, and he never really came up with uh, data that one could check. And uh, well, I will not go into details of that. I recommend David Cheno's paper, who invented the interior point method, uh, that was uh, is published in the book that I edited, Optimization Stories, in 2012, who describes it in detail. But in the end, uh, the story is that interior point methods or barrier methods that they are called are uh, superior uh, for large scale problems. Uh, but they are still not used as much because if you look at the use or running time for linear programming, it's still the simplex method is probably 80 to 90% in use because the real pure linear programs don't exist. They all have integer parts or something. And then the dual simplex algorithm is superior and interior point is only used in the beginning or in the end or something. People try to make use of it, but this, amazingly, the simplex algorithm is still dominating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I read that book chapter you mentioned. I, I have yeah. a digital copy of that book. Fantastic book. We're going to talk about that later, too. Um, since you're talking about linear programming, uh, is it true that you made all your students implement a simplex algorithm on the class? Yes, yes. So from the very beginning, when I started teaching linear programming, I made every student program the simplex algorithm. Of course, I explained the tableau, but nobody wants to, comp to, to program that. I explained implementation of details and so on. And I pointed out there are maybe numerical problems and then I asked them that this part of their semester's work to come up uh, with the code. And uh, there were real surprises. I mean, I had also computer science students who really complained that they had made an exact code exactly as I wrote it on the blackboard and it didn't work. And I told them that blackboard algorithm is not the same as an implemented algorithm. I wanted them to become more humble and understand what uh, implementation means. And uh, at the end, uh, I gave them always the NetLib problems uh, that were uh, available in the 1980s. There are about 100 problems, mostly from real world collections. Not very big, but still numerically difficult. And the usual student code only solved half of them. And then on the rest, they broke down for numerical errors. Very few finished with all, uh, solving all of these problems. And then you run uh, good code uh, like, uh, Today, it would be Gurubi or Cplex or uh, whatever is available. And they solve this in all problems in a few seconds. And they ran hours and solved only a half. And then they realized that's a difference and that uh, coding is not a triviality. That is something that often people working in pure math or so believe that writing code is nothing important, uh, but it is. And making math work. Uh, uh, is uh, a very big effort to transform the idea into implemented code that solves real world. And that is what I wanted to demonstrate. And the students learned it and uh, several of them founded companies and so on. And so it was successful and they learned the lesson, at least some of them learned the lesson. Let me say it like that, yeah. Yeah, uh, I also make my graduate students, the master students code, the simplex algorithm uh, i let them choose um uh, whatever they want like revise simplex or yeah. dual simplex etc and uh there are some people advocating against teaching the simplex method for undergrads uh, especially computer science students and less engineer students uh they think that one should focus on modeling and let the solvers uh do the the rest so so what's your view on this uh I, I, uh, I think there must be some people who can code. <laughs> so you cannot leave everything to somebody who has no idea of the theory because uh, implementing the simplex algorithm and branch and cut and integer programming, you need thorough theoretical knowledge. And you have to make implement this and understand what that means. Do you have geometric insight? 
And uh, giving this only as a, an arithmetic problem to a programmer is not the right idea. So I do believe you have to teach them writing good code. Modeling is another issue, and I think it's just as important. The only problem with modeling is that I do not know how to teach it. I mean, there is no theory of modeling. The only way uh, I've done it is by example, by showing real world applications, explaining this, explaining how this arrives uh, at, to, to me and how people explain it to me and how I, how I turn this into a mathematical problem. And this is teaching by example. So in a sense, it's an art or hand, uh, handcraft, but uh, I don't know good theory for, mo for modeling something. But it both is important. But uh, you, somebody has to learn how to code uh, algorithms. And uh, it, it, these people have to have mathematical insight. Otherwise, their codes will not be good. Right. Yeah. Some people argue that um, that will be a bit annoying for the student, uh, you know, going through the technical details of the simplex method. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about undergrad students, of course and that uh, one should not waste time teaching that because they will never use it uh, in practice. Like, for example, Ruben Ruiz mentioned that when we are driving a car, uh, we are not really aware of how the engine works and so on. And the similar uh, rationale can be applied towards a simplex method uh, in practice. So I'm not sure uh, what is the right call, uh, but I don't think there's an easy answer for that. Yeah, but uh, I don't share this view. And uh, here is something Man Manfred Padberg uh, always mentions, said, told me, I just checked it out. Omeda reis anthropos upai doetai. That's Greek. And uh, the Engl English version is a mensch, a human who has not taken a beating, lacks an education. Okay, that means you have to push them through that. I mean, you cannot always go the wonderful Broadway to somewhere. You have to go the bad roads and have to take the beating. Otherwise, uh, you will not be successful. And I don't, be, I don't believe that uh, you should concentrate on modeling only. Right. Um, how beneficial was the interaction between uh, industry and academia for your research work? Yeah, so uh, I already mentioned that we had this compulsory uh, internships. Uh, in order to establish this, I really went to companies in Augsburg and in Munich and around, and uh, I saw open doors, not always. Uh, and, uh, and in many cases, we were successful in getting involved in real research problems in practice where they wanted to optimize something, uh, improve something. And then we modeled this, and I, and I, I certainly learned a lot from that but it's not only the application all of a sudden you see new problems coming up that you've never thought about before and so it gives you an impact into into new uh, fields of mathematics or application areas of mathematics and if you want to hear examples uh, in the end it's telecommunication i mean uh, we were uh, addition initially thinking about how to uh, put fiber into ground and uh, making resilient or uh, net networks. Uh, uh, so we call them survivable networks with Clyde Monma and Mechtel Stör in the United States. And that is kind of solving certain connectivity problems that you would ne never thought of in uh, graph theory. They were different. And so that uh, opened up a whole research area and very interesting stuff. Later in telecommunication, uh, you had this frequency or channel assignment for mobile communication. And what happens in each new technology, whether it's GMS in the beginning, UTMS, or now Generation 5 or whatever, each time you have a new technology, it requires new mathematics. And uh, you understand, you have to understand uh, the, the technology in order to uh, make good solutions or even possibly optimal solutions in order to solve these problems. So these are sources of very interesting new uh, problems that you have not seen in mathematics that open up new application areas and they can be used elsewhere. Uh, so uh, for instance, I did work with Francisco Barahona in uh, about spin glasses and all of a sudden 
you can use it in order in, in industry, in chip uh, design or printed circuit board drilling or, and so on. And the same model and all of a sudden you have, have uh, connections. So I do believe that uh, the industry is a big source of uh, enlarging the, uh, the realm of mathematics. Yeah. And yeah. it's a great source of finding jobs for students. Yeah. yeah, that seems to be like the perfect setting. I wish other uh, programs, universities could uh, do the same. Sometimes it's not easy because there are cultural issues, ego issues as well. Uh, but uh, if you were to give a recommendation on how to proceed and how to create such an environment, what would be uh, your um, opinion? Yeah, the difficulty is in industry uh, to get to the right people. So. Uh, Fortunately, in Germany, the, the engineers are mathematically educated. I mean, they all can solve differential equations, but they don't know optimization yet, but they are learning it. Uh, but they uh, know mathematics is important. And so uh, with them, you can talk. Uh, then with, when there are managers, some of them have done management studies somehow, management science. And uh, there you have to find the right balance and you don't, you should not be too aggressive and uh, tell them uh, offer too much because modeling these problems is often very hard and not so easy to turn this into mathematics. But without really getting your hands dirty and going into the companies and talking to the managers, you will not have success. But once you have it, then the people, it goes by mouth. I mean, they tell the others, oh, here are interesting people, they can help you. And that happened in, in our public transport stuff. So in Berlin, we started out with the uh, disabled transportation system in Berlin that was called Telebus and optimized that. And later on, we went into bus routing and uh, then uh, Ralf Bondorfer and uh, Andreas Löbel uh, founded a company together with other students and were doing very successful uh, work in optimizing uh, public transport. But again here, for instance, it was extremely difficult uh, for, to solve these integer programs, like bus routing in Berlin requires integer programs with 1 million, 100 million variables. So how do you handle this? And uh, so I remember that Andreas Löbel figured out a new way to handle uh, the, the problem of which inequalities to use and which variables to forget and when to bring them in and so on. And that, that already gives new mathematical questions and that in the final end gives rise to new codes and new insights into mathematics. And I can only say this enriched mathematics in my own work and the work of my students uh, significantly. Yeah. yeah, the fact that you had engineers with this mathematical awareness uh, really helps. Uh, that should be uh, some, you know, conventional wisdom, I, I would say, but sometimes it's just not how it works. But uh, it's important that one follows uh, the example that you set, and there could be a lot of uh, good outcome from, you know, collaborations between academia and the industry. Uh, where were you when the Berlin Wall fell? And did this event influence your decision to move to Berlin in 1991? Definitely. So I was in Augsburg and I watching TV and I just uh, was thrilled and I just could not believe what happened. I really, uh, nobody expected that. Uh, and clearly, I would not have gone to Berlin uh, when Berlin was an isolated island. Uh, but then all of a sudden, I got an offer to go to TU Berlin, but more important to become uh, vice president of the Zuse Institute, uh, which has a broad range of applied mathematics and computer science with applications in many fields in medicine and biology and engineering and so on. And uh, I saw the uh, great potential of uh, increasing uh, my activity. And um, also, uh, I think, I, I believe that Berlin will become a vibrant city that's changing a lot. And I like change. I don't like to live in places where things are like before and not change. And uh, Berlin is always changing. People may dislike it, but I enjoy uh, 
all this uh, cultural scientific life that is always on the move and that is what made that was one of the decisions was to go to berlin and participate in the change and uh, that uh, was a really a positive move and uh, of course, we no, nobody expected what was really going to happen because that's something new that, I mean, a country broke down and is merged with another country. And although they have uh, joint traditions, 40 years have uh, changed uh, people and uh, it's, there are still differences between East and West, but that's how life is, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, the Zuse Institute in Berlin was named after Konrad Zuse, who's best known for coming up with the first programmable computer. He's also considered the inventor and father of the modern computer. Uh, from 1991 to 2012, uh, you were the vice president of TIP, and you served as president from 2012 to 2015. What were your main achievements as one of the main leaders of the Institute for so many years? Well, as I said, uh, TUSE uh, is an institution that's working in, in applied math. I mean, uh, there's differential partial and ordinary differential equations, optimization, stochastics, and applications of that, plus theoretical computer science. But what uh, we have done together with Peter Deufelhardt, who initially was the president, we've always tried to lo look for new areas to move in. And that is what happened. And I already mentioned quite a number of these application areas that we addressed. And uh, uh, that this in, enlarged in, in uh, medical treatment, in drug design, and, and so on. And uh, But what was more important possibly was we were able to establish a, a, a culture of collaboration in Berlin. Uh, that had to do also with the International Congress that, that was organized. and. Uh, that uh, Berlin changed uh, uh, from uh, former attitudes. I mean, there were three big universities, free universities, Humboldt and Technische Universität. They were fighting each other. Everyone wanted to be better than the other. There was another good research institute, the Weierstrass Institute and SUSE, and they viewed themselves as competitors. And we, the SUSE Institute was, I think, important for bringing these together making it a unit to work all in mathematics and its applications and combine their activities and capabilities. And that made Berlin as the, one of the vibrant cities in mathematics in general. And I think that the Zuse Institute contributed to that. And also, uh, what also happened in Berlin is there was no, there's no break between pure and applied math. So we have in the Mation, which we will uh, maybe talking about later, pure mathematicians and the hackers, but there is bridges between those and everybody knows you need the other. I mean, uh, the, the pure mathematician needs somebody who can code and the code person needs somebody who understands mathematics and gives some hints. and. Uh, during doing the application, you figure out problems that you don't, cannot solve mathematically. You ask your colleagues and they start working on this. And that uh, attitude of collaboration was established. And I think the Zuse Institute played a significant role in that. Mm -hmm. And the 1998 Congress of Mathematicians that you chaired uh, was a turning point for the mathematics community in Berlin, right? Yes, and this this was uh, actually a training ground because not only one could, opt, uh, could operate this, and uh, the leaders of all these institutions came together and we agreed on how to run it, and uh, it, uh, re we, we trusted each other. This was the important part. After the end of the Congress, which was very successful, there was trust, and that actually was a starting point for Matteon because just shortly after that, uh, the German government made a lot of money by selling, by auctioning out uh, frequencies for mobile communication. And they made much more money than they thought, and they decided to put some money into science and uh, open up uh, research centers. And uh, the Berliners uh, went into the competition and won such center. And the Mation was an extremely successful event. It ran for 12 years, and now that is now continued with Math Plus. 
And I, I think in the 12 years, we created 90 professors. I mean, people, young students who came in, postdocs and so on, and who stayed for a couple of years and then beca became professors elsewhere. And so in this sense, we have influenced uh, all of Germany uh, with the, the way of uh, approaching mathematics and its applications. And I think that is uh, one of the goals uh, that were achieved by all people together. It's not achievement of an individual person, uh, but by building trust and uh, 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 becoming aware of the importance of cooperation. Yeah. yeah. That is certainly a tremendous leadership achievement. Uh, at some point, there were like 200 people involved, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we had a lot of positions, but we also get money from other sides and so on. There. So there were in, in quite a number of years, we had 200 people were employed in, in Matheon. And so that's a very significant size for a mathematical research center. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I know that you're an incredibly efficient person, but how did you manage to supervise 200 master's students and 50 PhD students? I'm not even asking postdocs. Of, <laughs> I, 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 have to, I had a lot of help. Uh, namely, uh, the, the point is, uh, as I said, there, the SUSE was a big institute and I had uh, something like 40 or so people working. Uh, and uh, my idea was always to have master students and PhD students joining projects. Pro so we had lots of projects in different areas. And whenever the master student came, master student came, looked for a thesis, I told them, here is what is currently available, where there are interesting topics. What would you like uh, uh, to look at? And uh, then we agreed on a certain topic, and then I would we would be included in the team of working on that. And the same for PhD students. And uh, so uh, through this work uh, evolved the thesis. And of course, the thesis is, was now supervised also by the team that was working there. The students only occasionally came to me to see what, whether directions are fine. And uh, so I was in the beginning partly in the middle and in the end, I still had to read the stuff and <laughs> come up with grading and so on. Uh, but that was really uh, successful and uh, many students uh, used their thesis in order to find jobs uh, later on. And, uh, the, and the, the academic uh, um, students that they made PhDs, I mean, lots of them made great careers and you probably uh, know some of my uh, names of my students, some I already mentioned, like Michael Jünger, Gerd Reinhold, Yoshiko Bakabayashi, or uh, Alexander Martin, Robert Weissmann, and uh, Tobias. Tobias Achterberg, you interviewed, and Ralf Borndörfer, and Andreas Löbel, and, and so on. I mean, uh, so many uh, who are in, uh, in academia or in, in, in industry, and uh, I'm very happy about uh, the result of that. And there's basically no um, industry section where there's not one of my students working, whether it's uh, air, air airlines or trains or car manufacturing or consulting and so on. And I still have contact with some of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely more impactful than uh, H index, but we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in 2004, you created a school called Combinatorial Optimization at Work. Could you talk yes. about this initiative? Yeah, that was, um, so I was, uh, although I had many other jobs, I was regularly teaching and I do like teaching. I mean, I did like, I'm not teaching anymore. I'm now getting 75 and at some, at some point in time it's over. Uh, but without teaching, you don't get good students, as clear. And uh, students, if you teach well, then students like your subject. And that's how we had this inflow of students. But what I uh, uh, thought is I would like to combine this modeling and uh, uh, coding in a course. This I could not do in a regular course uh, in the university. So I decided to offer a kind of a summer or winter school, or a special school on combinatorial optimization. And since we had so many practical applications, the idea was basically uh, the first day is overview of theory. And uh, But this was not only for the Berlin students. They came from all over the world for, for these courses. 
uh, and they should know something about integer programming, combinatorial optimization. First day is the overview, and then basically every day in the morning you explain a particular problem, bus routing in Berlin, uh, UM UMTS uh, frequency assignment, uh, transporting of disabled people, and so on. <laughs> and you explain what you heard, and then you explain the theory that has existed and developed about this, and uh, in the afternoon, you model it. I mean, what are the inequalities that come up and equations, how you can come up with a model. And then uh, they were supposed to code this and they get data, real data from real life. And so uh, every day was also uh, one or two other students who were helping uh, with advising the students who knew the, uh, the software. They also got uh, software like uh, Cplex or Gorobi or, and, and so on in order to use that. And it was very successful. And actually, there is uh, soon in the summer another CEO at work coming, but now not by, not organized by me, but by, but my successors. And I think uh, many, many students liked this kind of approach where there is this combination of theory, mod I mean, real practice, understanding this, modeling theory and application and coding. And uh, that uh, uh, I, I taught this also in China and, and so on. And so I enjoyed doing this. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's another work. I mean, They were eight hours a day for two weeks. Only Sunday was a free day. OK, <laughs> so, wow. That, that's yet another wonderful initiative that you were involved with. Uh, it requires a lot of vision to think about these things and to um, organize it, put the right people in place, attract students. So that's great. Some time ago, you edited a book called Optimization Stories that we already mentioned, which is a treasure for those who are interested in the history of certain methods and events related to our field. Uh, when and why did you have the idea to organize such a book? Yeah, I told you already I'm interested in history and uh, I know many historians and uh, I've seen uh, that uh, what is really uh, written in books and is it true? I mean, what is the real truth of what happened thousand years ago or so? And who knows uh, what are the correct, what is the correct information? And uh, now I uh, observe that I like operations research, optimization, math programming, and so on. And we are in a lively time. And it basically began 50 years ago, or I mean 70 years ago. Of course, there was uh, Euler and others in former times, and uh, uh, but that is a very small number of uh, things compared to what is happening now. But if you look what is uh, has happened in this time, uh, it would be good to really know uh, uh, by those people who have experienced it what they think about it. So I approached like something like 50 other people and asked them to write up what uh, their version of the history of optimization is. I mean, Bob Bixby writing about development of codes for linear programming, Dave Sheno, I already mentioned, and so on. And all these people took it serious and uh, wrote up uh, basically oral history. I mean, this is not usually in history books, uh, but they were, I tried to convince them to write up also stories that are not usually reported in academic publications. And I enjoyed uh, doing this and uh, leaving uh, kind of uh, uh, memories behind, let me say memories. And I think they are good sources for the history in a hundred years or so. And. Uh, I, I know that other people like like that, and I, I believe that uh, now more and more people think of doing something like that, namely recording history while making. So if you look back at history and you will uh, find out that usually the books we know from the past are written by people who were asked to write these books by the winners of history. And uh, one person I have in mind is Charlemagne or Charles the Great. Uh, who uh, has a, autobi a biography, not an autobiography, a biography by Einhard, and it's called De Vita Caroli Magni. Of course, he was ordered to write the book, and he will not report independently, and uh, this is uh, not what we would like to know about history. We would also like to know the other subjects, which now come up 
uh, every now and then people find out that he killed his brother, Charles killed his brother and uh, treated other people not so well. But of course, all that does not appear in the Vita Caroli Magni. And if, if you look back, that is always the case. And so even in science history, although there are not people who murder others usually, but they report different things. And it might be good uh, to have various sides of view on the subjects. Yes. That book is also a way to preserve the memory of uh, the field. And uh, it will be nice if other people will take similar initiatives uh, in that regard. Uh, tell me about your contributions as Secretary General of the International Mathematical Union. Okay, so since I was the chief organizer of the 1998 Kong International Congress, I was elected into uh, the uh, executive committee of the International Mathematical Union and uh, served for eight years. And then I became for another eight years secretary of the International Mathematical Union. And the IMU is something like the United Nations of Mathematics. And uh, there are some, some 80 countries members and they have national committees and the IMU has committees where, on teaching history, philosophy of mathematics or electronic information communication and organizes the big conferences and uh, also gives hands out the most important distinctions, namely the Fields Medals and some other prizes. And uh, is, uh, is an organization that is independent of politics, tries to be as independent as possible from politics, religion and so on, and it seems to work somehow uh, and uh, has a very good image and what uh, happens is as a secretary general you basically run the business run the business and i have been a lot involved in con consulting advising uh, countries individuals universities and so on and i'm still uh, do going every now and then on uh, some tours uh, that are basically due to the fact that I was Secretary General of the International Mathematical Union based on the experience of giving advice. And that is what the IMU does, and it makes contact uh, between uh, mathematicians and offers uh, programs uh, to support visits and, and organize uh, meetings and, and so on. And I, I noticed how important this is, like, in Africa, in former times, there basically no contact between the countries. It was very difficult to travel from country A to B. You go via Paris or London or so. And uh, at international congresses, these people would meet and see them each other for the first time. The same was happening in, uh, in Central America or so in the Caribbean. And uh, I, I know about the educational programs there. And people now started working together about distance learning and so on. And I think that is an important part. And I enjoyed it very much meeting people from all around the world and making friends. And I think IMU has a very beneficial influence on the development of mathematics in general. Yeah, you were involved uh, in starting a PhD program uh, in Ecuador, right? Uh, yeah, that, that was actually independent of that. I gave, I gave a, uh, some lectures in Chile and... Uh, then came a student to me and said, uh, and he was on, uh, at this uh, uh, workshop and said uh, he is from Ecuador and he would like to get a PhD. And he was in the German school in Quito. He spoke German and whether I could get him a fellowship, I did so. And then uh, when he was going to finish, he, he said, why don't we try to do something more for Ecuador? And it turned out there's no PhD program in Ecuador at all. And uh, so uh, when by, uh, in one of my visits to Ecuador, so I gave lectures in Ecuador. Uh, I met with him and uh, professors there, and we decided to try out to start a PhD program. And I found money in Germany uh, who supported that, I think, eight or 10 years. Uh, and uh, so a PhD program in Ecuador started. They refounded the Ecuadorian Mathematical Society, became members of IMU. And some of these students are already professors, and I'm really happy about the development there. Of course, Ecuador right now is in a bad, in a bad shape due to the drug business that has nothing to do with Ecuador. Yeah. But, uh, that's how life is. Yeah. yeah. But in general, I'm still in contact uh, with my students there, and I'm happy at least about the mathematical development. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it's great to see your contributions going beyond Germany and uh, reaching places like South America. And this is very, very nice. Uh, since the 80s, you have been an active fighter for open access. How do you see the current situation in this regard? There's, number one is my belief. My belief is a public employee like I am should make all his research public, publicly available. And uh, research should be open for everyone, not only for the Germans, but everyone in the world. That is my personal viewpoint. And now, for the first time in the history of mankind, this is possible due to the electronic revolution. But we have this tradition of publishing, and that has uh, very different uh, aspects, and people uh, make money with it, others uh, uh, make careers with it, and have influence and power and so on. And it's very hard to change it. And I've tried very hard now since the and early 90s, even the 80s and early 90s, in order to start with open access. And now, of course, open software, open research, open science, and so on. Uh, but I think the view has broadened. But the mathematicians have always been the driving force behind this. I mean, together with theoretical physicists and theoretical computer scientists <clears throat> in medicine and engineering, that was not some topic you could talk about. But also, that has changed. And so I think we are on a good way, but it's very hard to, to change traditions. And also the big publishing houses are very smart on, on, on maintaining uh, uh, their position in the field. They are advertising now all these impact factors, age uh, indices, and all this nonsense uh, and in order to, uh, uh, to impress people or make politicians uh, uh, dependent on their evaluation and they, they believe they can evaluate scientists or f faculties or whole universities or countries, which is all not true, but it's just uh, advertisement. Uh, but you have to uh, be open about this and uh, explain to politicians and administrative people that that's not the way how to handle that. And I still fight for it, and I'm happy that there are many, many more people now uh, going that direction. Yeah, and how harmful you think uh, impact factor, age index, and so on can be to uh, mm. academia in general and scholars and students and, you know? That, that opens up a lot of room for cheating. And when, once you're a mathematician, you know there is a, a, an algorithm that decides on an impact factor, you can, and you now know you can <clears throat> change it <clears throat> by, well, building uh, in-groups or conglomerates of other people quoting each other and so on, and all of a sudden you push up people to the top of research, which are, not, uh, which are mediocre and so on. Uh, but other people don't notice. I think we the only way of handling this is still to look at individuals, to look at their work, to read the material. Uh, of course, the number of publications is important, and also the number of publications in good journals, that is also things to look at, but there's nothing else than looking into the papers and reading it and understanding it and talk to the people. And that is a message that I would like to uh, to. Uh, confer to everybody and say that uh, you should not rely on uh, impact factors and the like. Yeah. Yeah. Martin Labbe once told me that uh, impact factor is a disease. Do you agree yes. with her? I completely agree with that. Yeah. 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 Uh, what about your collection of 9,000 preprints? Yeah, you heard about that. Yeah. When, I, uh, when I retired, I had a collection of 9,000 copies of papers and preprints that I uh, collected over my academic life. And I tried to find somebody who was interested and nobody was. And I had to clean up my office. And at home, you see, my, book, my office is full of books. And I could not accommodate 9,000 papers. And I threw them away. And I did the same with my journals. I was collecting about 20 journals over time. And uh, there's this huge amount, and I asked all my students from developing countries where I would ship it to them. They didn't want to have it, so I threw them away as well. It was terrible. It's like throwing away bread and butter or so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like books you don't, paper you don't throw away, but that's how life is. 
Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, the elect I read the elect material now electronic, although I like to read pay on paper, but you can search. And uh, that is what the big advantage, of course, of the electronic documentation is. But nevertheless, I, uh, I was happy to have them on paper and could check them and have my scribbles on it and so on. Yeah. Yes. But uh, Martin, more. yeah, Martin, I would like to briefly hear your thoughts on specific subjects related to our field. Uh, to start, what is your take on the practical relevance of approximation algorithms? Okay, so uh, number one, optimization doesn't work without heuristics. Okay, there's uh, heuristics are everywhere. Uh, my goal is always to have exact algorithms, but even within exact algorithms, you use heuristics to make them faster. And heuristics can improve all that. So there, there is no doubt about it. And so we should work hard on finding new heuristics. But heuristics are cheap in a sense. Most of these algorithms are quickly to program and you can throw them in that people make incredible claims about the quality of this kind of heuristic compared to something else. I remember I once collected na 40 names of heuristics which starting from genetic and uh, but I, I, I don't want to repeat all this. Uh, there was one I, one I like best is divine intuition, okay? God's intuition or so, but it's a, it, it just words. Uh, and uh, uh, that I, I still, it's important to have that. But approximation algorithms uh, address usually difficult problems, namely how good can approximation be? How, how fast can you go up in the polynomial time algorithm? How close can you get to an optimum or so? This is theoretically very difficult, and it's a theoretical problem. And I, but I have not seen application of the algorithms that were devised for that in practice. The good heuristics are not necessarily the one. The good heuristics in practice are not necessarily the ones that have the best approximation ratio. And uh, so that is ex using heuristics and which heuristics to use is experimental mathematics, unfortunately and we have no guidance from theory. So that is an unfortunate development and a statement. I would be much happier if I could say the, the algorithm with the best performance ratio is the best uh, heuristics, but it's not the case in practice. Uh, that's what it is. And uh, still finding new heuristics is a good idea, but uh, it's overrated approximation algorithm from a prax from an, uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's important. From the practical point of view, it's overrated. Right. So let me see if I got it. Uh, regarding heuristics and meta heuristics, you see their value, although there have been some, uh, you know, weird, weird, weird uh, 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 things happening in that sense. But uh, you understand that they're important to find a near optimal solutions, sometimes even to warm up exact algorithms and so on. But approximation algorithms, those that, you know, deal with worst case scenarios and approximation ratio and so on, it's not that practical, although there is a nice theory behind it. And you have some concerns uh, about that. They have turned out, I have not seen uh, one of these algorithms that have best performance uh, being really good in practice compared to other heuristics. That's the point. It's an yeah. unfortunate development. I'm just uh, stating an observation. And that's that's how, how I view that. Yeah, I understand. I'm not saying that this is bad work. It's just the difficult stuff to find a good a good approximation algorithm. But that's a yeah. different issue. Yeah. yeah, especially if you see the scheduling literature, there's a lot of uh, approximation algorithms. and But uh, as you said, uh, we have not seen them put into practice in uh, let's say, impactful way. So yeah, but uh, there's also a thing that um, scheduling algorithms that are considered in theory are not really the stuff that is interesting in practice. I mean, the things that are done in practice are much more complex than what the, what the scheduling problems are that are discussed in books about scheduling. But still, you get good ideas from these algorithms. There's no doubt about that. Right. Uh, now, there has been an increasing interest in employing quantum computing to address optimization problems. What is your impression? Yeah. yeah. Well, I have been fighting in the last two years against these statements about quantum computing. I mean, they make hilarious statements about what quantum computers can do. 
and that is all nonsense, I think. Uh, so quantum, com quantum theory is a tremendous theory, and it's extremely important. It has interesting features and interesting applications. But quantum computing is not one of these applications we should wait for. So uh, I, I've uh, written a toast on this for Bill Cook's ber uh, birthday celebration, showing that uh, what people in qu quantum lobbyists state about quantum computing is 10 to the 13 wrong or something like that, a huge mistakes they make. They have not understood uh, complexity theory and still believe they can solve NPR problems using quantum computers. I don't believe in this and whatever has been claimed as quantum superior uh, supremacy has not stood the test of a few weeks. I mean, a few weeks later, people have shown they could do better and faster and can simulate quantum computing. So I, do, maybe I believe that quantum computing can be sub-processor for something, maybe in 5 or 10% of cases. That could be quantum computers help, but I don't think it will be a general purpose algor uh, algorithmic machinery for solving hard problems and uh, moving optimization away. And I, I don't believe that. Okay. Uh, inspired by a recent subject to episode with Bob Bixby, uh, Nathan Suderman Max requested me to ask the following question. Uh, between the 70s and 90s, the development of MIP solvers was fueled and inspired by the research done in academia. This seems to have changed now. What do you think are the reasons for that? Yeah, this is true. The big uh, breakthroughs were in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but I think uh, what is happening is something different now. Uh, namely, uh, that is what I experienced uh, from application. Now, let me give you one application. One is uh, optimization of gas pipelines. Uh, so I started around around 20, 24 years ago with this. Uh, with this. And uh, all of a sudden you notice why we are now coming to problems that I have no idea how to address. So uh, optimizing gas pipeline is one you have to flow through a pipeline. Of course, you can look up in the physics book how flow through a pipeline goes, but in practice, they have different formulas and it's much more complicated. So then you have directions, you have quantities. So basically, you have linear programming, integer programming, mixed integer, differential equations, nonlinearities, and stochastics coming in because you don't know what gas comes in from where with a ship or by pipeline and so on. But you have to keep pressure at all the exit and entry points at certain uh, positions. And uh, so we formed a team that uh, at, in, in, in certain periods of time were 30 people with 15 mathematicians of different areas and 15 physicists and engineers who tried to understand the pipeline systems. And Germany was 12,000 kilometers of pipeline in order to optimize the flow of gas through the pipelines. Now, if you go to a mathematician and tell him, tell him to come up with an algorithm that does linear, integer, mixed integer, stochastic, nonlinear, and multi-criteria at the same time, you say you are crazy and give up. Yeah, you cannot do this in theory. So what you do is, in practice, you look at these particular problems and address these issues. And that is now where these little steps are made, but they are not as big as saying I have a polynomial time algorithm for integer program, a linear programming. But these are now problems that are in the range of solv solvability and save millions or billions of, of dollars. Uh, and that is happening everywhere because now industry comes to us with problems that are really significant and really deep and really complicated. And now we have to merge forces that the stochastic guys talk to the nonlinear guys and talk to the integer programming guys and bringing their expertise together. And this is not as visible and it's not easy to digest. And that is what is happening at present, I think. Yeah, I, see. I, I don't expect a big breakthrough, even if you have now a, a, a strongly polynomial time algorithm for a linear programming, it would not change the world, I think. Uh, what, uh, what is much more complicated now to bring together, say, insights into differential, partial or ordinary differential equation and mix them with integer programming. And that is where the work is uh, done now. And uh, that is not as visible as before. Yeah. Right. 
uh i would like to thank nathan also for contacting you to be part of the <laughs> subjective series yeah so thanks a lot nathan um uh, Recently, you were president of the prestigious Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Uh, could you comment yeah. about it? Well, in a sense, that was uh, the pinnacle of my academic life, if you want, because before I have been mathematician, operations research, optimization with applications, and now I was president of an academy that has all fields possible. So this was founded in 1700, and uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was running all over Europe to find a king that, op that, that founds an academy that covers all subjects. There were academies that did medicine or uh, sciences, but not humanities and philosophy. He wanted everybody together, and then he achieved this in, in Berlin, uh, which was... This academy has changed its name 10 times uh, during the 320 years. So Prussian Academy was the most important uh, name when Einstein was an employee of the academy when he was in Berlin, as an example. Uh, and uh, now you have all these people from all these fields and there are so many extraordinary people. We had several Nobel Prizes in the last years, uh, Nobel Prize winners. And you can talk to these people and they... they give you a serious insight into what is happening. So that was my best education uh, in my lifetime because I had to give, uh, say, two or three addresses every week at some certain conferences, workshops or so. And of course, you start out with a 15-minute talk, but you have to know what these are doing. So I learn about it. And uh, that was a real pleasure, I have to say. And uh, but the, the academy was contributing, of course, contributing particularly to the humanities. And my interest there is archaeology, history, and languages. And I tried to use mathematics and help them. But it's not, well, it was not as successful as I thought, because we can give them some tools they can work with, but it never came out to be interesting for mathematicians. So it's just uh, we are supporters of their work, give them tools, but they are just not collaboration in a sense. And that is what is missing. But otherwise, uh, I tremendously enjoyed me meeting uh, all these uh, famous uh, scientists and uh, scholars from all other fields and uh, enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Uh -huh. I found a video of you uh, making a presentation when you started your term as president of the academy and uh, Angela Merkel was there in the audience yes. and during the presentation you showed a very interesting photo of hers when she was young. Uh, could you comment on, on that? Okay, so um, you, you have to know that Angela Merkel it, during the time of East Germany, did her, she was an employee of, the, of an academy institute, so she has a relation to the academy. Her husband is an academy member and I know him well. And uh, she uh, frequently, I mean, depending on the time she has for her, it was frequently attended academy events uh, just for fun because she enjoyed talking to a Nobel Prize winner in physics and let, explain, let her explain what happened. And this was the inaugura my inauguration. And I, uh, then she was giving the main lecture at the inauguration and I thought I'd be kind to her and uh, tell to the audience something that people would not know. And in fact, uh, she uh, was uh, a good math student, namely she particip participated in regional math Olympiad and won a gold medal. And I somehow got hold of a photo of her as sick at age 16, where she's sitting in the front row getting a gold medal. And she was very pleased to see that in the academy and uh, to tell that I could tell people she knows mathematics. And in fact, I asked her about it and she says, well, her husband often tells her about solving Schrodinger equations and to discuss uh, the use of it and what it means to chemistry and physics and so on. So um, this way, uh, quite a number of politicians are interested in the activity, activities of, my, of the academy, but Angela Merkel was particularly interested in, in physics, mathematics, and the like. Yeah, and it was interesting to talk to her. Yeah, yeah, should have been a wonderful experience taking this important role for the academy and interacting with famous people. I, I understand um, uh, how how important for you it was this experience. Do you have any regrets? 
No. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, I manage my life decently and uh, I may make mistakes over time, that's clear. Sometimes make an enemy which you did not intend to make, but that didn't happen very often. A uh, few, few things I would have done differently, but basically I don't have regrets. I think uh, I have uh, I had a wonderful life, and I think it could continues like this. And I was able to manage uh, both being an academic scholar and family and father of a family with three daughters and now five grandchildren. And uh, you know, that is uh, I'm grateful for having had such a life and uh, hoping to live a few more years and uh, uh, being able to follow science and family development. Yeah. Yeah, and how is life after retirement and what do you intend to do next? Well, uh, I promised to my family that I really reduce my academic uh, business. So I rarely go to conferences, give talks every now and then and a few evaluations. But usually I plan traveling with my wife. We both enjoy that. We have common and joint interest in history, archaeology, archaeology, literature, and so on. And we do exact plans of where to go. So next trip, a bigger, bigger trip will be to Central Asia, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan, and so on. And uh, the, that's what we enjoy and, uh, and we like and uh, interact with our, our friends and having not more pri private life now. Well, the health issues come along, but you better ignore it because that is going to help to happen to everybody when you get old. Yeah. Uh -huh. Would you like to leave a final message to the younger generation of operations researchers and optimizers? Yeah, I th uh, there's always difficulty to give uh, uh, good advice. My thing is be authentic. In uh, figure out what you like to do in your life, what your interest is, what you want to do, and what you enjoy. And that is, I think, the basic important piece of living in a successful life. It's not going for big money or prestige or something. Do what you enjoy. And that is important to figure it out. And that may change over life. And uh, as I told you, uh, I have changed my career path uh, every now and then. Look at what others do, get advice, but make your own decision what for your next step. And that means be authentic, that uh, feel what is good for you, your family, and uh, that is the most important part. It's not uh, getting a big prize or something is never a good goal. It's, uh, the, the goal is to achieve what you really want to do. And that is my, uh, my only adv simple advice that I have. All right. Martin, thank you so much for your time. This has been really a wonderful experience for me to interact with you. I had so much fun listening to your stories and inspiring uh, achievements and also advice. So I'm super grateful. I mean, thank you so much, Danke. I thank you very much also, and I would say obrigado. <laughs> ah, <laughs> de nada. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, I know I spent one semester in Sao Paulo and a few words remain in my memory. Okay, yeah. goodbye. Yeah, so you, you know your way uh, to Brazil. You, you came here already. So in case you are interested in visiting us, we are the extreme point of South America. So it's an maybe an exact place to, to be uh, and to visit. So. Let me know if you're interested in... in, yeah. in this is one things. of the areas of Brazil I have not seen yet. So maybe sometime in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks and bye-bye. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Take care. Take care of your health. Bye. bye. Ciao.